Father in heaven, we come to you in the name of Jesus, thanking you for another opportunity we have to look into your holy word. We ask that you will be with every listener, those who will listen now and those who will listen later as this is also recorded. We ask that you will speak to each and every one of us. Teach us the things that you will have us to learn just now. In Jesus' name, amen. We're looking at our series, continuing in our series, Types and Shadows, a biblical look at the sanctuary message. And brothers and sisters, we're living some very serious times. We're living some very uncertain times. We live in times of uncertainty where men's hearts are failing them for fear as they see the various events and things that are happening in this world. And so people right now, what they need is not another uh, inoculation or they don't need another elixir to fix C19. They don't need another um, mask to cover their face. They don't need any of these things. They don't need to stock up on toilet paper as if that's going to solve the problem. What is needed right now, and I'm not saying you shouldn't take care of yourself, but what is needed right now, what people need is the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel is a wonderful simplifier of life's most difficult problems, and that's what's needed. And the sanctuary reveals to us the gospel. And so right now, people need the Lord. And my question is, what is the church doing right now? What is the people of God doing right now? And this question I'm going to ask now is the title. Are you the light of the world or dark like the world? The light of the world or dark like the world? Which, which, which one are you? Because right now, people need the Lord. They need Jesus. They need to see Jesus in us. They need to see the exemplification of his character, his righteousness in his people. But my question to you is, are you the light of the world or are you dark like the world? We've already looked at the table of showbread. We've already learned that that was on the north side. We already looked at what the 12 cakes on the table pointed to. It pointed to not only literal Israel, but also spiritual Israel, especially the 140 and 4,000. We looked at that already. We already looked at uh, what the golden table pointed to, the, the table of Shittim wood overlaid with gold. We learned that the Shittim wood pointed to humanity, gold, hum, hum, gold divinity. We, we learned that it had a crown on it and also a crown within a crown, a border. So we, we see right there that points to Christ, who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We, we looked at all those various things already. I'm not going to go in too much time in that right now. Right now. Um, we also talked about how the priest, every Sabbath, laid fresh bread on this table, as you see on the picture. So that points to the fact that every Sabbath, you should be getting fresh sermons. You should be getting wholesome sermons, not stale moldy sermons, not stale moldy bread, not wonder bread. We need whole wheat, wholesome meals that's going to prepare God's people to stand in these last and evil days. We talked about that already, not going into much detail right now with that. But now we're going to go over to the south side and see what was on the south side of the holy place. What was it on the south side of the holy place? We're going to Exodus chapter 25, starting at verse 31. Exodus chapter 25, starting at verse 31. Write these scriptures down. We're going to be going through some scriptures as usual. So we're in Exodus chapter 25, looking at verse 31 through 40. Talking about this emblem here on the south side of the holy place in the sanctuary inside the tabernacle. It says, and thou shalt set excuse me, verse 31, and thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold of beaten work shall, shall the candlestick be made. Pure gold. His shaft and his branches and his bowls, his knobs, his flowers shall be of the same. Pure gold, right? Verse 32, and six branches shall come out of the sides of it. Three branches of the candlestick out of the one side and three branches of the candlestick 
out of the other. So the candlestick had pretty much six branches, three on one side, three on the other. And of course, you got the one in the middle that, of course, that makes seven that, you know, but they're not counting that. They're just counting three on this side, three on the, uh, the other, counting a total of six. And then they can't, that one candlestick itself with the one light that would, of course, make seven, seven lamps, of course. But reading on, verse 33. Three bowls shall three bowls made like unto the almonds with a knob and a flower in one branch and three bowls made like almonds in the outer branch with a knob and a flower. So in the six branches that come out of the candlestick, verse 34, and in the candlestick shall be made, shall be four bowls made like unto almonds with their knobs and their flowers. Verse 35. And there shall be a knob under the two branches of the same and a knob under the two branches of the same and a knob under the two branches of the same, according to the six branches that proceed out of the candlestick. Verse 36, their knobs and their branches shall be of the same and it shall be one beaten work of pure gold. Verse 37, and thou shalt make the seven lamps thereof. So you got this, uh, the candlestick with a total of six branches, but of course there are seven lamps. So it says, and thou shalt make the seven lamps thereof, and they shall light the lamps thereof, that they may give light over against it. And the dongs thereof, and the snuff dishes thereof, shall be of pure gold. Of a talent of pure gold shall he make it with all these vessels. And look that thou make them after their pattern, which will show thee in the mount. Moses had to make everything according to the pattern, according to the blueprint that God has showed him. And it's very important for us in these last days because we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And it's very important for each and every one of us to follow the blueprint, to walk in the way that God has called us to walk according to, as it is revealed in the word. Just like in the mount, it was revealed to Moses how to make this tabernacle in God's word because we are the tabernacle. We are the temple of the Holy Ghost, the Bible also says. And we must follow everything that's outlined according to the blueprint, according to the model, which is the word of God. This is what God is calling us to do, friends. And we're going to look at these various things. So what does the candlestick represent? Let's go to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. What does this candlestick represent? Revelation chapter 1 starting at verse 12 revelation chapter 1 beginning at verse 12 and we're going to skip to verse 20 the bible says and i turned to see the voice that spake with me and being turned i saw seven golden candlesticks verse number 20 it says the mystery of the seven stars which i saw is in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks, which thou sawest are the seven churches. So we see that this candlestick points to the church. This is what we're looking at here in the sanctuary. Now in Revelation, it says seven candlesticks, but we understand that they, you know, in Revelation, it pretty much individually separates them. But in the actual tabernacle, it's all pretty much one with this various branches. But it's pointing to the same thing because each one of those, the, uh, the, the uh, seven candlesticks have seven lamps. When you look at the seven branch candlestick in the Old Testament, it has seven lamps pointing to the same thing. But what we're seeing right here from the word of God, this candlestick points to the church. All right. Christ explained it. This is coming from the cross in the shadow by Stephen Haskell. And this is what he says. Christ and explaining to John the meaning of what had been what of, of what he had seen, excuse me, said the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. The number seven in the Bible denotes a complete number. The candlestick of beaten gold with the seven bowls for the lamps was an example and shadow of heavenly things. It's seven branches, each holding aloft a lamp represented the church of God. So we see it right here. This candlestick points to the church. All right. 
Reading on, this is the cross in the shadow, page 50 and 51. The individual that forms a part of the church of the firstborn, which are enrolled in heaven, will often feel the worksman's hammer. For we are his, God, his or God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. What is our work? To let our light shine like the candlestick. It, it, it's, uh, the candle is to allow its light to shine and not grow dim, right? That, that candlestick had to be beaten and molded and shapen so that it could be used for the good work that it was, that it was made for. And so we, as, as Stephen Hassel quotes the scripture, we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works, Ephesians chapter 2. So we'll often feel that works Miss Hammer. And then it goes on, it says, Then, beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. That's what God uses to chisel us, by the way. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. It is only the master workman fashioning you to become a part of the great church enrolled in heaven. See, one thing we need to understand here, your name could be enrolled in the church book or on the church record. You may be accounted as good and in regular standing to whatever church you may be a member of. What, what doesn't matter. That's not the point. The bottom line is if your name is not registered in the Lamb's book of life, if you're not enrolled in heaven, it doesn't matter what your profession is. You will be just like what the Bible says, depart from me. Ye that work iniquity, enter into hell fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. But I taught and, and, and preached the impre I never knew you, Jesus says. So it's very important for us to not just be a member of a church, but to make sure that we're living holy lives, that we're letting our light shine so, so that men may see our good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven so that our name, and of course, making sure that we're surrendered every single day to Jesus Christ so that our name will be in the Lamb's book of life, enrolled in heaven. What is the mission of the church? I think many of us have forgotten our mission. I think many churches think that they're just a social club where you just come, hear a good sermon, and then after you hear a good sermon, and, and, and then you just go and sit at at the lunch table and just talk and just have a good time. Now, I'm not against fellowship, but we need to understand what the mission of the church is. What has God raised the church up for? Is it just a social club? Is that what it is, just a social club? Will we just come together and have various socials? Is, that's what it, is that what God raised the church up for? Let's look at it. Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 14. Matthew 5, starting at verse number 14, reading to verse 16. Matthew 5, starting at verse 14, the Bible says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good what? Works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Jesus says you are the light of the world. If you're set, if you're, if you're a city that's set on a hill, you cannot be here. In other words, you got to be in the position to let your light shine. Don't take the light and hide it under a bushel. Don't hide it amongst yourselves. Let your light shine. Go out. Don't be hidden. Get out. Sit on that hill like that city. Sit on the hill. Go out and let your light shine, the Bible says. We're hiding our light under the bushel. We need the light. The light must shine. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. What is the condition of the world right now? I'm telling you. People need the Lord. The Bible tells us the condition of this world. It says in Isaiah 60, verses 1 through 3, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. So the Bible says we're living in an age or time of darkness, not, not just moral darkness, not just... Darkness, when it comes to people understanding this truth that's in the word of God. But the Bible says 
gross darkness. The darkness is deep. The gross darkness to people. What is our mission? The Bible goes on to say, but the Lord shall arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And what will happen as a result? And the Gentiles shall come to thy light and kings to the brightness of thy rising. If we let our light shine, the Bible says Gentiles will come to the light. If we let our light shine, the Bible says kings shall come to the brightness of thy rising. If we let our light shine, presidents, yes, senators, governors can come to the light. People of high influence, people who are, are, who are rich in wealth, they will come to the light and use the money and influence that they have to support the cause. But we're not letting our light shine in this time of gross darkness. We're, we're, while the world is in gross darkness, we have this light of truth and we're hiding it under a bushel amongst ourselves where we need to set that light on a hill so that it can shine and so that people can come to the light. We're to let our light shine, friend. 1 Peter 2 verses 9 and 10 says, but ye are a chosen generation. What else? A royal priesthood. What else? A and a, and a holy nation, a peculiar people that we should do what? That ye should show forth the praises of him who have called you out of darkness into his what? Marvelous light. We're to bring, we're to, we're to show forth the praises of him who have called us out of darkness into this marvelous light. We're to show forth that praises. How are we to show forth that praises? Not just with our mouths, but by our lives. Not just by what we say, but how we live. Verse 10, which in time past were not a people. We were not a people, but now are the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And you just want to keep this to ourselves and not allow others who are out there who don't know this truth, who don't know Jesus, to not allow them to have the, the experience of the mercy of God and his grace. We just want to keep it to ourselves and talk about all the goodness of the Lord and just talk about it amongst ourselves. But what about those people out there who are hurting? How about that young man that's thinking about committing suicide and taking his life because he, 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 he don't know what else to do? You know, he, he, he. He just got out of prison and, and he's trying to find a job and everybody's turned him down because he's, he's a felon and, and, and his family has turned their back on him and he's trying to get back on his feet. Nobody wants him. Everybody's shunning him away. And guess what? He's just like, man, I guess I'll just end my life. What's the purpose? And he's thinking about ending his life. And, 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 and where's, where's the individuals who profess to believe in Christ? Where are they to go to knock on these doors? Where are they to go to go door to go, go door to door to try to reach out to these individuals and let them know everything's going to be all right. Let them know, cast your cares upon Jesus for he cares for you to let them know that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. All the answers that you're looking for, he has the answer. Where are the people to go out and knock on the doors? Where are the God's people, God's church to push away from the table, to get up out of that seat? And so you know what? There are some people out there who are going to Christless graves. How can I got to save at least one? Where are the people to be like Desmond Doss? When he was when when he was drafted and he and he he, he said, you know what, because of my convictions, I'm not going to carry no gun, but I'm going to be a medic. I'm going to go out there and help my wounded comrades. And guess what? In the line of fire, as guns are shooting, bombs are going off. I got to save one more. I got to go out there and save that comrade. I'm going to take a risk. I'm going to go out here into this danger zone and bring these individuals to safety where they can experience healing from their wounds. Where are we to go out into these dark areas, into these dark communities and, and snatch these souls who are in darkness on the verge of death? When are we gonna step away from our comfort zone and get into the, the, to this danger zone with Christ, understanding that Christ is with us. He says, Lord, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. We are, but he, he has commissioned us to go when are we going to go and, and snatch these souls, bringing them to the foot of the cross, to rescue the perishing, to care for the dying? The only thing we care about is a church membership. Let's be real. That's all you, 
If you're just worrying about growing a church membership, what, what's the purpose of your existence? No, we are to rescue the perishing, care for the dying, not have this attitude of, oh, if you don't fill out this survey, or hey, if you don't do this Bible study, if you just reject it, or oh, you, you don't want to do that right now, but you just want me to pray for you, hey, I'll cut you loose. I got to go to this other, come on, man. Don't have that attitude. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful. You got to be merciful. Jesus will say, you got to seek to save. Come on, brothers and sisters. We got to be re for real about this, this truth we claim to believe in. Revelation 18, verse 1 through 4. Notice what the Bible says. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power. And the earth was what? Lighted with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a habitation of devils and a hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations are drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, what? My people. That she be not particulars of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. See, we focus on the message, but we fail to pay attention to the experience of this angel that comes down. We fail, we fail to understand it, brothers and sisters, because that angel that comes down, the Bible says the earth was lighted with his glory. What is the glory? What is this glory? Not his glory, God's glory. Remember, an angel represents a messenger. So this is a messenger of God giving a message. Just like the three angels in Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 to 12, they are giving a message. And so the Bible lets us know that this is not man's glory, but this is God's glory. The earth is lighted with his glory. What is the glory of God? We're going to look at it just now. What is the glory of God? That is to lighten the whole world. Exodus chapter 33. And they're going to go to Exodus chapter 34. Exodus chapter 33. Then we're going to Exodus chapter 34. The Bible says, and it came to pass. Matter of fact, let me start right here. Verse 18. Exodus 33 verse 18. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of of the Lord and before thee and will be gracious to whom I'll be gracious and show mercy on whom I will show mercy. So Moses asked, he said, Lord, I beseech you or I beg you, show me your glory. God says, okay. He says, I will, I will make all my goodness pass before you for before thee and I will proclaim the name of the Lord. When you look up the word name in the original Hebrew, that word name means character. So Moses asked, Lord, I, I beg of you, show me your glory. God says, okay, I will proclaim my character. I will show my goodness by proclaiming my character. It's just like this. Let you ask, let me borrow your truck. Yes, I'll let you use my F-150, my Ford F-150. Talking about the same thing. So when Moses, Lord, show me your glory. God says, okay, I will, I will, I will show you my goodness and will proclaim my name, my character. And he did just that. Reading on. Verse 20, and he said, Thou canst not see my face, for no man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will, make, I will put thee in the cleft of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. So we get to Exodus chapter 34. God actually does this. 
And the Bible says in verse five, and the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and did what? Proclaimed the name of the Lord, proclaimed his character, the glory of the Lord. It, reading on, it says in verse six, and the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious and long suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping merciful for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. So when we look at that angel that comes down, which represents the messenger of God, that angel that comes down, and just is a, a little extra for, for you Bible students out there, when in Revelation chapter 10, that is none other than the personage of Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 10 that begins the Advent message, begins and sparks the SDA movement. So we see this angel in Revelation chapter 18 comes down. That also points to Christ being re represented or manifested in his people to finish the work, to finish the movement. How? By just a message? No but by a message that is being that that is being preached not by words but by the life but by the character of Christ being perfectly reproduced in his people the character of God being represented by his people so the glory of God is his character so the bible says light in the earth in revelation 18 the bible says the earth was lightened with his glory that's what gave the message power because it says he cried mightily with a strong voice. That's what gave it power. Very important. We got to exemplify the character of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, we have to learn to love. We have to learn to not condemn people. We have to learn. And it doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter, brothers and sisters, whether it's a, a, a leader all the way at the top or whether it's a lay person all the way at the bottom. Now, we condemn sin and apostasy and call it for what it really is, whether it's public or whatever. If it's private, you deal with it in private. If it's public, it's got to be rebuked publicly. However, we need to understand that we have to have the character of Jesus. We cannot condemn people. You don't know who a devil, you don't know who a, Je you, you don't know who's a Jesuit and who's not. So it's not your place to try to judge or condemn somebody and understand that even a Jesuit can be converted. Very important for us to understand. I've seen individuals and claiming quote unquote present truth condemn individuals in high places of apostasy, 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 apostasy. And yes, there is rank apostasy, no doubt about that. And yes, it must be rebuked. And yes, we must, we, we, we must give the trumpet a certain sound and point people to the truth that's in the word of God and also get a solution. And I've seen individuals, apostasy, apostasy, here, there, but their families are messed up. Their families are messed up. Their homes are messed up. Husband and wife, divorced, married to another woman. How is it that you're married to another woman without biblical grounds for divorce? Oh, look at what they're doing in the church. They got all this. They got the dancing, but you dancing at your wedding? But yet you want to talk about uh, the rank apostasy? We can't be hypocritical. If we want to point out certain things, you better make sure you write with God. Very serious. And we have to make sure that we'll exemplify his character. Do I support a posse? Absolutely not. Will I support it? No. Whether it's regular or irregular lines, it doesn't matter. I stand for truth. And if it's if it's a regular or re irregular and it's truth, amen. But if it's error, I will not support it. However, whether it's regular or irregular, we need to make sure that when the person does wrong or when there's rank apostasy, be careful not to condemn people. If you turn or are attempted to make a, a particular reform in the area 
when you want somebody to treat you with with, with, with love and and, and, and and say, amen, brother, that's right. Now, now you need to do this right here. You need to, you, you know, amen. Then when you want somebody to do you like that, instead of like, oh, you could, oh, he's evil. He's Satan. Oh, come on, brothers and sisters. The way you treat others, well, it demonstrates how you yourself want to be treated when you find yourself in a similar situation. We got to exemplify God's character. Are you changing your position on certain things? No, I'm not changing my position. I'm standing, I'm still standing for truth and I don't support apostasy, not, none whatsoever. But even, even in that, we, that's why it's very important for us to read the Conflict of the Ages series and read, especially I'm going through great controversy with the church right now. And when you look at these Protestants and how they stood against apostasy, but at the same time, you could tell that they were loving Christians. That's what we got to have, brothers and sisters. They weren't condemning people. They pointed out sin. They condemned apostasy. But at the same time, they exemplified God's character. And this is one of the attributes of God's character that many of us lack. In 1 John 4, 8, where it says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. That's what we need. Let's condemn the sin. Let's condemn the error. And sometimes, you know, a lot of times we, when, when the thing is public, we have to, you know, as we condemn the error, the person is right there. But we need to understand, brothers and sisters, that that doesn't give you the right as you expose the error, to drag the individual that did the error, drag them and just mother them all in the mud. No, we don't do that. We don't want to do that. Because men can change if we pray for them. They can reform if we pray for them. Don't be shocked when you see a lot of individuals who are in the regular lines, who have done things they should not have done. I'm thinking about Manasseh as I say this, and they reform. While many of us who claim present truth, and I'm seeing it right before my very eyes, many who claim it to believe present truth or have professed to believe present truth at one time are falling away. Be very careful. Make sure your foundation is in Jesus. So this light Going back to the subject now, this light, it was, it's all related, but this light represents God's character. The light that we're looking at right here, this candlestick, points to God's character. This is the, what the church is to do. The church is to exemplify the character of God, the character of Jesus before a lost, dying, and grossly dark world. That's what we're supposed to do. Not just sit down and have potluck and have socials. We have a work to do. Colossians 1, verse 26 and 27, even the mystery which I've been hid from the ages and from generations, but is now made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of his glory, the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. What is it? Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Is Christ in you? Or is the world in you? Is Christ in you? Or is the demon of anger in you? Or is the demon of strife in you? Or is the demon of jealousy in you? Or is the demon of in envy in you? Or is the demon of intemperance is in you? What is in you? Is Jesus or is it sin? We need Christ in us. The hope of glory. That's the only way. This work can be done. That's it. It's not just about various techniques of evangelism. It's not just about, okay, we got a six week plan or we got, we're going to use real truth Bible studies and we're going to do surveys and all this and that. Now, mind you, you got to have a strategy, but it's a whole lot deeper than that. If Christ is not in you, you can have a well thought out plan 
a well-organized plan for evangelism, but it will fail. Why? Because they don't, the people don't care about how much you know. They want to see how much you care. As the song said, rescue the perishing, care for the dying. If you don't care about them, you're not going to get up and rescue them. Something to think about. What else is the light that must be seen through God's church? Psalm 119, verse 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a what? A light unto my path. Here's another one. Proverbs 6, 23. For the commandment is a lamp and the law is light. And the reproofs of instructions are the way of life. So God's word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. His commandment is a lamp. His law is light. So his true church, the true church of God, will uplift Jesus by reflecting his character to a lost and dying world. They will point people to the truth that's found in the word of God. And guess what else they will do? They will uplift the standard of the law, which is also light. Any church. They're saying you don't have to keep God's law. It's not the true church. Any church. They're saying that you don't have to keep the commandments. That they were nailed to the cross somewhere. And by the way, I got some studies on that already. That they were nailed to the cross. That church is not the light. They're not the light of the world. They are dark like the world. See, when you, we, we, the, the Bible says the commandment is a lamp and the law is light. If you take away the light, what do you have? Darkness. So you got many bodies of darkness, even as we speak. The Bible says in Isaiah 8, 20, to the law, to the what? To the law and to the what? Testimony. Testimony of the prophets, testimony of Jesus. If they speak not according to this word, not lining up with the scripture, not speaking according to the word, what is it? It is because there is no light in them. Bodies of darkness, not the light of the world, but dark like the world. Which one are you? Where do you stand? Not only as a church, but also as individuals. Where do you stand right now? How else are we to shine? How else are we to shine? Isaiah 58, looking at verses 6 through 8. Isaiah 58, 6 through 8. The Bible says, Is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free and that you break every yoke. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house when thou seest the naked that thou cover him and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh? Then shall thy light break forth as the morning and thy health shall spring forth speedily and thy righteousness shall go before thee and the glory of the Lord shall be thy real reward. So if we're doing the work of God, helping those who are in need, doing medical missionary work, we are, the Bible says, then shall our light, as the scripture said, then shall our light rise, brothers and sisters. Christ Object Lessons 414. Practical work will have more, far more effect than mere sermonizing. See, the problem is we, we heard too many sermons. We, had, we, we got enough sermons. Got enough sermons, brothers and sisters. We need more practical work. Practical work will have far more effect than mere sermonizing. We are to get food to the hungry, clothing to the naked, shelter to the homeless. And we are called to do more than this. The wants of the soul, only the love of Christ can satisfy. Not only meeting physical needs, but the needs of the soul. If Christ is abiding in us, our hearts will be full of divine sympathy. 
the sealed fountains of earnest Christ-like love will be unsealed. Acts of the Apostles, page 9. What is the purpose of God's church? We read in the Christ Object Lessons, read it from the scripture, to let our light shine, that they may see our good works and glorify God which is in heaven, Matthew chapter 5. But here, Acts of the Apostles, page 9 says, the church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of men. It was organized to have service. Is that what it said? Did it say it was organized to have a church service? It was organized to have AYS. It was organized to have uh, just Sabbath school and, 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 and to have a uh, Wednesday night prayer meeting and, and Bible study and also on Sabbath to, to have a sermon. And of course, let's have another sermon and uh, a second sermon. Is that the purpose of the church? Is that the reason why God raised it up? It, no, it says it was organized for service. See, we got it backwards. See, we think we got to have service. No, we got to be, we got to give the service rather. We have to give the service. We have to be there to give the service to the people. Not just to have service, but to be the service. What are we doing? It was organized for service. Its mission is to carry the gospel to the world. That's our mission. It's to carry the gospel to a grossly dark world. But what are we doing? We want to have Super Bowl parties. That's what we want to do with food and drinks and, and woo! Yeah, go, go Carolina Panthers. Go Buccaneers. That's what we want to do. We want to have Halloween harvest festivals. Probably I should do a study on Halloween in the future and the origin of it. I should do that one day. I'll think about that by God's grace. But I'm going to tell you this right now. There's no true church of God will be celebrating Halloween. Easter should I say it? Should I say it? Nor Christmas. Ooh, ooh, ooh. But, 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 but Sister White said, you got to understand, light is progressive. The same Sister White in 1850-something said, that, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be talking, you know, we, we, we shouldn't be pointing out people eating pork and all those different things like that. We, should, we shouldn't do that. When God will reveal that light about pork eating, he will reveal that light. 1863 came, health message. And of course, God revealed about other things and of course, unclean meats and all those different things. We got to understand, light is progressive. Remember, remember when David wanted to build a house for the Lord? And, and Nathan was expressing to the prophet, I mean, D David was expressing to the prophet Nathan about what he wanted to do in building the house. And Nathan said, all that, all that is in your heart, do it. God is with you. He went on. Then God came to Nathan and gave him more light and said, no, no, uh, 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 uh. David shall not build my house. He has, he, he has shed too much blood, but his son would do it. So Nathan comes back to David shedding the additional light. God has revealed to me that you won't do it, but your son will. So you can't say, whoa, 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 whoa. you got to point to the, the quote with Sister White. No, brother and sister, you got to think of, she even said herself, when reading the testimonies, time and place is to be considered. We don't even consider that. We don't even think about that. Read it. When reading the testimony, I only had a quote on me. Just if you have the E.G. White app or whatnot, Time and place. You can type that in. Testimonies. Time and place testimonies. You should be able to search it. But she says, when reading the testimonies, time and place is to be considered. If God, if we're not going to celebrate, if we're not going to celebrate Halloween and we're not going to celebrate Easter, why in the world are we going to celebrate Christmas, Christmas? Now, mind you, it's a perfect opportunity to share Jesus. It's a perfect opportunity to share the, uh, the truth about Christ and to, uh, you know, you can sing songs to individuals and you can uplift their spirits. Hey, maybe a group of individuals who they can lift up their voices and sing hymns about Jesus and, and, and wrap up some gifts 
uh, of, of true field literature to give to those individuals. Maybe you can use that opportunity instead of feasting and feeding yourselves and helping those who are in need. There's nothing wrong with that. But what I'm saying here is, if we're not gonna, if we, if we're saying the Halloween is satanic, Easter is satanic, all steaming from Catholicism and paganism. What about Christ Mass? I gotta, I, I gotta study even on that, showing how it just is pagan and a pagan origin, just like Halloween and Easter. All those things that I mentioned have nothing to do with Jesus. Jesus is not born on December 25th. You know who was Tammuz the son of Semiramis and, and uh, Nimrod, the moon god and the, the, the sun god and the moon goddess. Then got Tammuz. Come on, man. Easter had nothing to do with the resurrection of Jesus. Easter, the goddess, it comes, Easter comes from Ishtar, the goddess of fertility. What does an egg, a chicken, and a rabbit got anything to do with the resurrection of Jesus? What does Yule logs and, and trees and, and wreaths have anything to do with the birth of our Lord and Savior? Halloween comes from the term All Hallows Eve, holy evening. What's so holy about an evening when you got in, you got when you dressing up your young children and looking like ghouls and ghosts and witches? What's so cute about that? What's so what's so holy about that? Don't you know what the scripture says about those things? The dead know not anything. I have a whole study on that. I have a whole study on talking about uh, uh, witches and wizards, what the Bible said about that. There shall not be found among you those things. Yet we dress our children up in these various things, don't, not even knowing the origin of where this stuff come from. But yeah, we're bringing it to the church. You know what that shows us? We're not the light of the world, but we're dark like the world. 1 John chapter 2. Verse 15 to 17. Oh, no, no, no. Don't talk about my dancing. Don't talk about the dancing. Yes. Don't you know that pantomiming has its origin in ancient Roman times? Probably back further than that. But I read where it says that I read something where it talked about Nero. Nero was a pantomime and pantomiming was used to mock the Christians. And yet we have the Christians taking that pantomiming and bringing it into the church. Something that was used to mock the Christians and their God. How sad. We just accept things because it looks good. All right, sounds good. We better accept things and make and, 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 and that line up with the scripture. Very important. 1 John, 15, 1 John 2, verses 15 to 17, the Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. We're not to love the world. We're not to love the things in the world, brothers and sisters. We don't have time for the NFL. We don't have time to place our children before Nickelodeon. We don't have no time to be watching Family Guy, which is a, 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 a TV show, cartoon, which I used to watch years ago, that mocks Jesus. I could show you clips. I could show you all this stuff, brothers and sisters, but I'm not going to do that right now. We got no time for all these television shows like Scandal and all those various things. As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message, but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth, abandoned their position and joined the ranks of the opposition. By uniting with the world and partaking of his spirit, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light. And when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy and popular side. You better cut these things of the world off. If you're not the light of the world, but dark like the world, this is going to be you right here in the near future. I promise you. Who is the candlestick? And how can I effectively bring light to a dark world? We talked about it. But let's bring it home even further. Second Samuel 22 verse 29 says, For thou art my lamp, O Lord. 
and the Lord will lighten my darkness. John 15 verses 1 through 5. John 15 verses 1 through 5. Let's see what the Bible says here in John 15 verses 1 through 5. We need to get ready to wind this down. We're going to get as far as we can. John chapter 15 verses 1 through 5. The Bible says, I am the true vine. And my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for, with what? For without me, ye can do nothing. Without Jesus, we cannot effectively shine in this dark world, shine and reflect in reflecting his character that must be perfectly reproduced. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. The Bible says in John 1, verses 1 through 5. Notice, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the what? Light of men. And the light shined up in darkness. And the darkness comprehended it not. Jesus is the light. And he says in John 8 verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Wait a minute. Jesus, I thought you said we were the light of the world. Now you're saying you are the light of the world. You got to understand this. In order for each and every one of us to be the light of the world as a church, as a body of believers, we must individually receive Jesus, the light of the world. Because it says right here. I am the light of the world, and he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have what? The light of life. If you have Jesus, the light of the world, you will shine as lights in the world. Very important. Now, there are seven lamps. Seven represents completion. It also represents perfection and holiness. Why is this important? God is calling us to be a perfect church. Ephesians 5, verse 25 to 27 says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might cleanse, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. God is calling his people to be holy, without blemish, to be a people who are gaining new heights every day of victory, the experience of victory over sin. That's what God is looking for without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. But there's only one way that's possible. What do these seven lamps represent? What else do they represent? Revelation chapter four, looking at verse five, Revelation chapter four. And we're going to look at here, verse five, Revelation four, looking at verse five. The Bible says, and out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there was and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the what? Seven spirits of God. Seven lamps, seven spirits of God. And when you go to Revelation chapter 1, it talks about the, uh, the, the, these, 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 these same seven lamps. In Revelation chapter 1, it talks about the same seven lamps. It says in uh, Revelation 1 verse 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, Grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. So the, 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 those seven lamps point to the seven spirits before, it says before the throne right here. So when you look in Revelation chapter 1, the message goes to the seven churches. At the end of each message, it says, 
He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Each of the seven churches, it says that at the end, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So there are seven spirits of God. So the reason why the Bible calls him seven, it calls the Holy Spirit in Revelation seven spirits of God is because at each period of the church, the Holy Spirit was there. Each period. So the, 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 the seven lamps also points to the Holy Spirit. This is the only way, brothers and sisters, this can be made possible. It's not by might nor by power, but by my what? Spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. There's more we can go to point to the Holy Ghost in this. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 24. Leviticus chapter 24. We can see the Holy Ghost even more. Watch this. Leviticus chapter 24, verses 1 through 4. The Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring unto thee pure or olive, beaten for the, for the light, to cause the lamps to burn continually. Without the veil of the testimony in the tabernacle of the congregation shall Aaron order it from the evening unto the morning before the Lord continually. It shall be a statue forever in your generations. He shall order the lamps upon the pure candlestick before the Lord continually. So in order for us to shine effectively, we need the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters, so that we can shine continually. Very important. But in order for that, in order for the candle to be lit, it needed the oil. You go to Zechariah chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Not going to go there for time's sake. Zechariah 4, 6 says, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord host. So the oil also points to the Holy Spirit. All right? How can I receive the Holy Ghost? L let's read this. Zechariah 4. <laughs> Zechariah 4, verse, verses 11 through 14. It says, then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? So these two olive trees are giving, are feeding oil into the candlestick so that it can flicker, the, the flame can flicker, it can be ignited. Verse 12, And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered and said, and he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. And he said, and then he said, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Now you read this again, uh, a similar experience in the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. Let, let's, let's look at it real quickly. Revelation 11, verses 1 through 6. The two olive trees are the anointed ones. What, what does this represent? Now we're looking at how can we receive the Holy Spirit, right? Notice. We're going to Revelation 11, verses 1 through 6. It says, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. This is talking about the period of papal supremacy, forty and two months. You take forty, you take forty-two times thirty, gives you twelve hundred sixty. That's twelve hundred and sixty years of, of, of papal dominance, right? That's a whole nother study. We'll look at this when we go to the book of Revelation. I'm just throwing it out there right now. Verse 3, and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days. There it is. Twelve hundred and sixty days are years. A day in Bible prophecy equals a year. Twelve hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. What does the Bible say about these two witnesses? Verse 4, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man hurt them, 
fire proceeded out of their mouth and devoured their enemies. And if any man hurt them, he must be, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over the waters to turn into blood and to smite the earth with all the plagues as often as they will. Who are these two witnesses? That's the question now. Who are they? Because these two witnesses are the two anointed ones. Who are these two witnesses? God's witnesses, when you look at the word witness, it also means testament or testimony. The thing that has power is the word of God. Isaiah 55 verse 11 says, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please and prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. For 1260 years, the papacy kept the word of God from the people. And many of God's people were persecuted because they were sharing the word of God or holding to the word of God. So many, you know, they, 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 they were killed and all these various things as they were trying to share and hold to the, to the scriptures. The word of God was under attack during this period. So the word of God, the Bible says, has power. So this points to the Old and New Testament. And the Bible also mentions in Revelation, if you add or take away from the word, God will add unto you the plagues that are written in this book. Then the Bible said, let's look at it real quick. In Revelation chapter 11, it said, you know, if any man hurt them, they will be hurt with the plagues. So we already looked at Isaiah 55 verse 11 and showed that God's word is powerful. Because the Bible said in Revelation 11 that these two witnesses have power, right? So, so it said the two witnesses, if any man hurt them, that they, you know, had power to uh, give these plagues, be hurt by the plagues. But Revelation 22, looking at verse 18, says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God will add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. The scriptures, the holy word of God, brothers and sisters. This is pointing to the old and new Testament, the two witnesses, the two olive trees, the two anointed ones, Old and New Testament. The question is, can I lose the light? Can I lose the experience? Can I lose the Holy Spirit? Can the light ever go out? Revelation 2. Verses 1 through 5. That's a whole lot I could mention tonight, but I'm not going to go too deep uh, with the other scriptures. I'm just going to go ahead and try to wind this down. Revelation 1, verses, uh, Revelation, uh, excuse me, Revelation 2, verse 1. Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 1. It says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write these things, saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labors, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And hast tried, thou hast tried them which say they are apostles that are not, and hast found them liars. So this is a church right here that was strongly against apostasy. This is a present truth church. You better believe it. Verse 3, and has borne and has patience for my name's sake, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Verse 4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art what? Fallen, and repent, and do thy first works, or else I will come upon thee quickly, unto thee quickly, and remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Your light can go out, brothers and sisters. Do you want your light to go out? All you have to do is lose your first love. Lose your experience that you had with Jesus, especially when you, when you first saw the light. Of course, you didn't know everything. You, were still, you, know, you still obeyed, but you had this freshness. You had this, this ardent, this deep love 
But over a period of time, you know, being a member and good or regular standing in the church and, and just going to the potlucks and just having a good time sitting there in church and, you know, you have no burden for evangelism. You, you weren't excited about sharing the truth with people, sharing books with people like you were before. You don't have that burden to study God's word like you did before, to draw closer to Jesus like you did before. Became nominal. You allow work life to, to, take, to take most of your time so that you don't have time to spend in God's word. You don't have that deep excitement that you had before when you first came into the truth. You became formal, nominal. Lost your first love. For some, they've lost their first love by becoming high and puffed up thinking of themselves more highly than they ought to think. Holding on to some darling sin. What is it that's causing your light to grow dim? You, 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 some of you, your light is, dim, is, 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 is flickering. It's, it's about to go out. What is it that's causing your light to flicker? To almost about to go out? To, to, it's, it's starting to fade out a little bit. What is it? But to have a talk with Jesus, have a talk with God and he will reveal to you what is in your life that's causing that light to grow dim. How are we to share the gospel? Matthew 24, verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come. That word witness means to testify. In other words, that gospel is not only to be shared by a, a giving a message, by pre preaching audibly a message, but it's, it's talking about allowing the message to be presented by our lives, our conduct. For a witness, it says, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness, a testimony, revealing to the people what God has done for you. What has Jesus done for you, brothers and sisters? I can go on and on tonight, but I don't even want to do that. My question to you is, are you the light of the world or are you dark like the world? That's my question. Where do you stand with God? Time is running out. We live in a world of gross darkness. Where do you stand with God? We see that that candlestick, what it represents, it not only points to Jesus, of course, he is the light of the world, no doubt about that. But it also points to the church, how we as a church ought to be ignited by the Holy Spirit. To be lights in a dark world. To allow a light to shine continually. To not let it go out. What causes it to go out? Sin. Is it your desire to be the light of the world? Or do you just want to be dark like the world? It's decision time. It's time to make up our minds what we're going to do. It's time to stop halting between two opinions. If God be God, follow him. If Baal, then follow him. But like Joshua said, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As, as time is drawing closer and closer to the end, I see now more than ever that it is time to set our city on a hill and not hide our candle under a bushel. No, no longer are we to keep the light to ourselves. It's time to set this light on the hill and let it shine. So kings and Gentiles and, and people from all over can be drawn to the light. Because Jesus says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus.
Help us, Lord, in these last and evil days to let the light shine. Help us, Lord, to, to study your word, to, to be obedient to the principles found in your word. Because the scripture says in the book of Acts, the Holy Ghost is given to those who obey. We got to obey your word. Got to take heed to the word. We got to study the word. We got to allow the word to, to abide in us. If we want to shine effectively, we got to be connected to the vine, connected to Jesus. Just like those branches, those individual branches on that candlestick. That points to Christ, the, the, the followers of Christ being connected to the true vine. That's how we can shine. In order to be the light of the world, we have to receive and be connected to Jesus, the light of the world. That's what that, that, that's what that candlestick points us to. Those six branches connected to the candlestick itself points to the experience that God's people must have. We must be connected to Jesus like those six branches were connected to the candlestick. So Lord, may that be our experience so that we can effectively shine to a dark world. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have any topic or question, please comment below. Thank you for your prayers and continued support.